thinking about how to efficiently do things at every moment in time has been something that you know, I, I think is, is very important because you're always trying to optimize, you're always trying to get better. And if you're not, someone else is. And so if that's the case, you're going to be at a disadvantage to someone who is learning, who is kind of has that mindset of how do I make this system better? Welcome to the Smart Venture Podcast. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest from the Silicon Valley, where unicorns roam and innovation never sleeps. We've got top investors, superstar founders, and well-known tech executives lined up to share their secrets on building and investing in successful companies. Just a quick disclaimer, while we may sound like financial geniuses, but please don't mistake us for your friendly neighborhood financial advisors. So let's get started and dive into the wild world of tech entrepreneurship. Our sponsor, Alumni Ventures, offers individual investors access to venture investing through its diversified, professional-grade venture portfolios. The company's funds have consistently outperformed public market equivalents with over $1.1 billion raised and invested in over 1,100 portfolio companies. They have a dedicated team of 50 full-time venture investors and were the number one most active venture firm in the U.S. in 2022. And Number three, globally at crowding to pitch bug. Investing in venture capital can help reduce the overall portfolio risk and increase the likelihood of stronger returns. To learn more, visit av.vc slash grace. That's av.vc slash grace and schedule a call. Investors must be accredited. Please note that all financial investments involve risk. Past performance does not guarantee future results. And it is important to conduct your own research and seek professional advice before making any investment decisions. Now, please enjoy the show. Hi, Daniel. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. By the way, I have like a kind of like a burning question. So like this is just like literally just came to my mind right now. So did you do like the leadership in tech? Uh, yeah, I did. How uh, was leadership it? Leadership in tech was yeah. the best program I've ever been a part of in my leadership development and just general development I can't say enough good things. I actually recommend everyone take it because it it just expands your mind on how to think about things and how to deal with interpersonal relationships. I recently went on one for like the four day retreat and then I saw your name on top of the website and then like I was like, oh, well, how cool. So did you yeah. do like the one year one or do you, did you do like a four day one? Uh, it was a one year commitment, but started with the four day uh, okay. in person. Yeah. Um, and actually COVID happened shortly thereafter. And so all of our meetings subsequently were all on Zoom. Oh. Uh, which was a really okay. interesting dynamic. That's really interesting. Yeah. I'm definitely gonna check out the one year program. But anyway, okay, so we're gonna go back to um, you know, your childhood. So like you grab your with with your brother, and then your brother is Justin Khan, which is another like legendary founder. Obviously, you guys are both super successful. And then through like the podcast interview you, you've done with him, it sounds like your mom was like super entrepreneurial, who is like doing a lot of like startup ideas or like um, just like entrepreneurial ideas when you guys were young. And to like start off the show, I would definitely wanted to learn more about like, you know, how those impacted you and your brother and like, how did that like kind of like shape you into who you are today? You know, from an early age, I think I saw my mom running around doing basically anything and everything she could. And, and so she was originally got a computer science degree, was a programmer, got laid off, uh, then became a real estate agent. Uh, most recently, and this was after we graduated from, mm -hmm. from college, uh, she got a psychology degree and, and is a family therapist as well, mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, has gotten into uh, niche physical therapy exercises and become licensed in that as well. Mm -hmm. And so you know, throughout her life, it's always been about how do I make myself better? How do I learn new skills? How do I then, I, I then apply those to uh, a career? And I think that's something that stuck with me um, and probably my brothers as well, as, as we've kind of entered the workforce and uh, started companies and hired people and uh, whatnot. So uh, it's been a pretty 
uh, interesting upbringing, I think, uh, seeing my mom go from basically computer science to real estate was, that's a huge shift. And then even to family therapy, that's like another mm-hmm. giant shift in mm-hmm. skills. Because like you mentioned about like, you know, some of the lessons you've learned was like, you know, every issue is solvable or like at an early age, you tried two super different type of works. And then like you tried like teamwork with your brothers. Those are lessons that you took from from this. But like, I I feel like there's a lot of entrepreneurial mom out there, like one mom that can just like raise a couple billionaires in the house. So I'm curious, like, what do you feel like was like the things that like you've feel like was like a like definitive character in you and your brother and you know how how the education kind of like applied onto you guys maybe it's like a self-taught thing like after you guys came to san francisco yeah i mean the two things first off not billionaires yet and (laughs) got a long way to go there but you know i think for us it's been uh it's hard for me to say, oh, this is the thing that every parent should instill in their child in order to create a successful company and or to be able to have that entrepreneurial spirit. I think problem solving was first and foremost the, the thing that we all always looked at. There's always problems instead of giving up, thinking about how to break those into smaller pieces. You heard a little bit about that on mm-hmm. our podcast. And that applies to everything we do, everything we do today, everything I do now. Uh, it's about efficiency. I tell the story to my team, but uh, I once got in trouble for cleaning the table in a non-square mm-hmm. pattern uh, from one end to the other. And it's something that has stuck with me because that's the most efficient way to clean a table, right? If you're mm-hmm. wiping it down, but it, it, it's just been... I think thinking about how to efficiently do things at every moment in time has been something that you know, I, I think is is very important because you're always trying to optimize, you're always trying to get better. And if you're not, someone else is. And so if that's the case, you're going to be at a disadvantage to someone who is learning, who is kind of has that mindset of how do I make this system better? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing I'd say is, look, uh, there's a lot of luck involved in creating something at the right time um, in the right space. Uh, there's lots of people who've tried to build self-driving cars before us, and there's lots of people around us who are also trying to build self-driving cars who are uh, you know, in, in similar positions or you know, have had different outcomes. And you know, I can't take credit for, for all of this myself. I've got a great co-founder and Kyle and a great team. Uh, that has been on the journey with me. Thinking about, you know, your co-founder as well as like your brothers, I'm curious, like, who do you consider as on your personal board of advisors? And how do you kind of like build up this cohort together? Uh, It's a great question. I think one of the things my my brother says is you're the amalgamation of your closest friends. Um, And so a lot of my closest friends are actually the people I've talked to about startups because they're in startups, they're, you know, CEOs and investors and other things in, in a lot of startups. Um, and that's been probably the the best way for me to understand, you know, what am I missing? Because you know, we've, we have our own board at Cruise. We've got people around us who kind of help uh, with the strategy. We've got our team who also does mm-hmm. that. But when it comes to being completely open and honest and and whatnot, you can't necessarily always do that with your team. You should strive to, but there are certain things uh, that, you know, you'll want to talk to people who have gone through similar situation in another company with. And so those are, those are the people that I uh, tend to talk to the most about. It's, you know, maybe 10 of our closest friends. How do you like find this cohort of people? And I tend to feel like, difficult and to a degree to like keeping in touch with these people because people are busy and then if there's like no I guess like gain involved like it's really hard to like kind of force people to talk to you and to a degree like I'm curious how did you encounter them and then how did you kind of like maintain the relationship throughout the years yeah uh, so we have been close friends since I moved to San Francisco for the most part one of them as an example is my old boss and a mm-hmm. uh, friend, you know, we've, we've just been friends for a really long time. And I think in some ways it's been 
you know, fortuitous. We just kind of happened to know a lot of these people through YC, through my brother, through uh, some of our other friends. I went to high school with one uh, of my close friends uh, who was actually the best man at my wedding. And, you know, for me, sometimes there's an exchange, right? Sometimes I'll want something out of it, uh, you know, information, how they're doing something. But a lot of times, you know, this is, it's just, it's about friendship. It's not transactional. It's about, you know, enjoying that other person's company and talking about something interesting and having something, uh, in a lot of cases, some of these uh, advice or other things, it's just an interesting conversation on how to deal with a problem and uh, finding people who are interested in that, again, in that growth mindset of, okay, if I talk to you about this, maybe that can help me in some way as well. And so it's not in that same way, super transactional that in, in a way that like, you know, they feel like they need to reciprocate if I give them something. Throughout your career, you've kind of like started multiple startups and then like you're currently running one. What do you feel like was one skill that you're kind of constantly trying to get better at? It could be like a soft skill like sales or like a technical skill like coding. Like what would you say were something that like you're constantly trying to learn? I think the thing that I'm always trying to get better at is people management. And we talked a little bit about leaders in tech and kind of the program there. You know, I didn't go to business school. You know, the first time I managed people, I was what, like 21, 22, 23, something like that on my first startup. And I had no idea, right? Because in this, when I entered the career, my career, I joined a startup of four people. And so management and personal development plans and skills that people want to learn was just like, we didn't have those conversations in a four person startup. It was like, mm-hmm. okay, here's the task. Check in with me when you're done type of mm-hmm. thing. And so I didn't really have a model for what that should look like up until, you know, I started working and started understanding what people want out of their career and understanding how to align people's incentives with the company's incentives. And so I remember my brother gave me this advice. I was managing somebody and I was micromanaging them and I didn't really realize I was doing it. I was like, oh, you should do this in this way. And they came back with something. I was like, I was kind of getting pissed off that like it wasn't being done in the way that I would do it. And he pulled me aside and he was like, hey, look, you should either let that person do that job or you should do that job. But the way that you're doing it right now is just pissing everyone off, Mm. like both of you off. And that's something I still remember. It's like, you got to trust the people around you because you're hiring smart people and they want to do the right thing. And so it's either a direction, they're getting the wrong direction or they are, you know, maybe maybe the wrong person for that job. But either way, you've got to let them try and either succeed or fail. And so that's something that has stuck with me since, uh, you know, for the last 10 plus years. And what's actually funny is uh, I still work with that person uh, who mm-hmm. I was micromanaging uh, today. So it's, it's things that's have amazing. Well, that's amazing. Like you went from being a macro manager to like, you know, retaining an employee for over like, I don't know, 10 years or something. That's like a really impressive thing to do. I'm curious, like in terms of like the lessons from like working with your brother you guys built a company called exact before and then it was it started with like a i will help you to do everything company and then now well like when you guys sold it it become like a just like a cleaning company so i heard about the journey from the quest podcast and one of my curiosity was when you guys first started since you guys were brothers you guys probably already have a lot of experience working together What were you doing back then? And then what was he doing? And in terms of like strength, what do you identify was your unfair advantage? And how do you kind of like leverage it into the business side of things when you started working together with your brother? Yeah, so the split in the beginning was, uh, we had a third co-founder, my my friend from high school, who I'm still close with, who was kind of our CTO. I was the operations guy uh, who was in charge of, you know, finding and hiring these people to come, these contractors to come work on our platform. 
and really running the operations of the company. And my brother was a CEO. He was going to go out fundraising, help with the product and, and general kind of like company things. And that was probably the split for a long time. I, I think I moved into kind of running the HR finances uh, operations for the business for those, the couple of years that we ran it. And over time started helping you know more with the product and understanding what people liked, what people didn't like, how to make our, our workers more efficient or our contractors more efficient. And that was really the split. Right? It was Justin, if you've, if you've met him and know him, he is the ultimate salesman. He's <laughs> excited about everything until you know he can get get people to invest and then he'll move on to the in, into the next uh, thing that the company needs, which in mm-hmm. our case was figuring out you know, how to get real sticky users. And what we found was the stickiest users were the ones who already knew what to do with the service uh, and that happened to be cleaning. And so that's kind of mm-hmm. how we pivoted into what became exec, the cleaning company, uh, which was a far cry from where we started and the ambitions we had, but it was, it was the way to really a show that we could get traction or, or have users come to the service and be retained. So you know, over time, I think I've really been, when, when we started Cruise, uh, it was the same type of role where Kyle was the CTO and the COO and, and kind of focused on the technology. Mm-hmm. And I kind of was behind the scenes uh, working on making sure the business was running, recruiting, uh, mm-hmm. finance, HR, comms, all that stuff. Are you happy with like being the behind the scene? Because it sounds like maybe this adopted from your early childhood, your brother always kind of taking the lead to do all these things. And then you guys kind of like assisting him to do whatever he wants to do. So I'm curious, like, do you feel like there's something in there that's like kind of like built into you to like kind of adapt into this CL lifestyle? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I don't need to be the person in the spotlight, I think what I've learned a lot about myself over these years is I get a lot of joy from making others around me better and Mm -hmm. more efficient and uh, helping them succeed, Uh, whether it's people on my team or whether it's people who are my colleagues. And so that naturally fits. I don't think I knew it at the time. I think I was just kind of following his lead because he had started his other company and it was natural for him to be the CEO because he could go out and raise money. And that was kind of, as you mentioned, an unfair advantage because he's done it before, right? Versus mm-hmm. myself who, you know, just showed up and said, oh, hey, like fund our company. And so there was that that angle. Uh, at the same time, I think I am, I like I'm not seeking out the spotlight. I don't need to be the person who has a million followers and is uh you know in the news all the time uh and Um, i think i i prefer like i'm what i tell my company and and everyone who joins is i'll be successful when cruise is successful right and and that's how i should look at it because that's the most important thing yeah i think that's a really good intrinsic value to like not getting validation or like not seeking validation from like the outside world to a degree I'm curious, like, okay, so at this point after you started Exact, like, what what do you think were your takeaways to help you start Cruise? You you didn't start Cruise technically. You, you joined your co-founder, and then I've gained the sense of like, you know, because Exact was a cleaning company, you guys all hated like the it's just like not super exciting as a subject. And then when you join Cruise, it sounds like it's like more exciting subject. Like, you know, it's a, the future and the, like the technology is more exciting in terms of like as a founder, like what were your major takeaways that you kind of like learn from this process starting the first company to this second one? Well, this technically is your second company because you started like a kind of like a restaurant app business before that. Yeah. So yeah, but TLDR is like what we're yeah. our, our learning. So, there. so for those who, who don't know, we started before exec, there was a company called Appetizely, uh, which was building apps for restaurants, uh, which 
was not very successful at all. We built a few apps and then we got a call from Apple basically saying, you gotta, you can't do this anymore. You're, you need to, they all have the same functionality and you need to be rolled into a single app, which was not the sell, right? Every restaurant kind of wants their own app. You know, that was kind of the, the appeal uh, to be able to do that easily. And so we pivoted that, that company became exec. It was actually the same entity because we, it was just me and my other co-founder working on it for a couple of months. And I think to get back to your question, you know, the thing that I learned was it's very, very hard to teach people new behavior. And what I mean by that is exec started off as a service where you can do, or you can have anything done for you for $25 an hour. It might've even been $20 an hour, which is kind of insane. And what we've learned very quickly was that even people who had free credits had a hard time envisioning what to use the service for because most people don't have personal assistance. They don't have people, they're not good at directing them. They don't really know how to formulate the task in a way that some random person can come and say, okay, I got that. The mm-hmm. things that they did know how to outsource was actually cleaning, right? Cleaning was a behavior that a lot of people, you know, had already started outsources or outsourcing where they grew up with cleaners coming into their home. And so they knew, okay, this is something that I, I know what I'm getting. I've done it before. I have someone come, they clean my bathroom and leave. And so that's why we pivoted. We pivoted because that was the thing that was sticky and that was the behavior that people already knew. You know, the other side, there were, was groceries um, and Instacart really succeeded there. And those were the two kind of main things. We also saw research as well, but uh, research was was quite difficult because and it, it takes someone who's actually really good at research to find the types of things that you're looking for. But carrying that into Cruise, I think one of the things we learned was you know, we've got to start with something that people already understand. And Uber was taken off at the time and Lyft and, and Rideshare. And that seemed like an easy behavior to really go and, and tackle. Not an easy from a technical perspective. It's, it's very difficult to actually drive mm-hmm. autonomously. But a behavior that where you actually get into the back of a car and you're not driving. And so that's something that if you replace the driver with an autonomous vehicle, then you know it should be a one-to-one swap for a lot of people. And that's really what we're seeing today is, is there's a pretty high rate of adoption because people are, they understand it. They, they might be a little bit nervous at first, but, but they're still willing to try it. They see the value. And that is, that's been something that stuck with me and, and kind of carries through is, you know, it's hard to teach people new behavior, building off an old behavior and, and making slight modifications is really the way to go fast and, and grow quickly. In terms of like building crews, as you mentioned, like people may not be like super familiar with like self-driving cars. At the beginning, when you joined the company to eventually you guys sold the company, how many different stages have you went through as a co-founder of the company? And how many different like stages did the technology change throughout this process, like having a prototype called RP1 and like you guys were trying it out, like basically trying it out to like, you know, eventually having like, you know, right now you guys kind of like actually have a car that's like self-driving in San Francisco. How many different stages did it went through both you and the company? Yeah. Uh, well, let's start with uh, the company because that's, that's pretty quick. We started off with product that we were retrofitting onto a gas powered vehicle uh, that would drive your car on freeways um, autonomously. And this was quickly seen as a nice to have product, right? You have adapted. It's essentially what Super Cruise is today from GM, where you know you press a button and you can sit back and take your hands off the wheel and it'll drive you and then take back over and get off the freeway. The problem with that is most people see themselves as above average drivers. And so to pay what we were gonna charge $10,000 for the system didn't have mass appeal because most people are like, well, if I have to pay, but I still have to take over when I wanna get off the freeway, Mm -hmm. might as well just drive myself. And 
So what we found was, you know, in order to retrofit cars, it was going to be pretty difficult. And in order to really grow this in a huge market, we were going to have to support hundreds and hundreds of vehicle models and types. And that was going to be pretty hard. And so we quickly pivoted after we had a prototype that we used uh, to show that we could actually build technology. We pivoted that into the first iteration of basically what we're building today, which is full autonomous in cities, point to point, no driver. You can't even sit in the front seat. So all of our cars that we've deployed in, in San Francisco, Austin, and Phoenix, we've got ride share currently in those three markets. Um, and we're opening up two more uh, shortly, Houston and Dallas. Uh, those you can't actually access the steering wheel. You as a user, you use the app, pull a call it on your phone, it pulls up, you get in, it drives you to where you want to go and you get out. And so we've been working on that since we basically a year after we started. Um, and it's been, uh, what, nine plus years now, almost, um, almost 10 years for me of working on this product and finally you know a, a couple of years ago we started deploying them and now we've got customers in them so that that's been the journey of cruise it's been really interesting it's been a lot of changes a lot of ups and downs when it relates to me you know i've i've run probably almost every team at cruise at one point uh, except for probably the engineering team mm. uh, which kyle has, has always focused on and today I run uh, the product design, research, and marketing teams. Uh, so kind of the user-facing things uh, in the company and customer customer facing. And so it's been a it's been a journey. Right, I, I, we talked a little bit about learning the, the mindset of learning, and I think we've gone through several stages of that. We've uh, had to adapt our style. Through COVID, we've had to adapt our style through this massive uh, inflationary period and, <laughs> and kind of into, I don't know if we're calling it a recession or not yet, it's unclear, but that that economic situation as well. So along the way, I've had to learn, I think, a lot of about how to motivate people. We're now <laughs> you know, 3,000 plus people in the company. And so I don't, I don't actually, I don't get to do any of the fun stuff anymore. I'm not sitting in there writing the prds or coding anything or anything like that it's uh mostly helping other people be successful how fast did it grow like because you mentioned like right now it's like three thousand people and then when you guys started there were like two co-founders and how many different stages did the company went through what were the core skill that like you feel like helped you succeed in these like different stages so when we started, was, uh, there are four of us, Kyle, myself, Rita, and Rusty, who were mm -hmm. uh, two, two of the smartest people I've ever met mm -hmm. uh, and, and really just get stuff done. But we quickly grew, I think when we were acquired two years later, less than a year after we raised our Series A, we were in, in about 2016, I think about 40 people. And then from there, we've grown, we, we went through a period of growing really quickly um, and then continued to grow, you know, as a company, but have, have slowed our growth because we've just gotten a lot bigger, right? Um, mm -hmm. Don't need to hire in percentage numbers as many, uh, but still a lot of, of people. So it's it's been pretty crazy there. I think there was a period of four or five years where we were doubling the company every year, which is a big drain on culture and how you work together because everyone comes in with a different mentality of and, and background of how things get done and no one is no one's wrong in that everyone just has different styles but it's oftentimes really hard to align those different styles together so that was one thing that we we really had to focus on is you know, making sure everyone understands this is how we work uh, this is the type of company we're trying to build. How do we create uh, psychological safety for for people who are coming in who not, might not necessarily have the same relationships with people who are more tenured, all that. Compared to your company, um, there's I bet like there's other people trying to start something like a self-driving car company before, but not many people took it this far. 
because of like one of it is maybe in terms of like fundraising or getting in front of the right investors and then like being able to sell your company and sell yourself. That's like one skill. That's what I could imagine would cut out a lot of like competitors. The other one is, um, it sounds like you guys were like super hats down to build the product instead of like doing a lot of PR, which is kind of like the opposite of what people are doing in Silicon Valley to a degree. Like people were trying to create FOMO to make sure that like, you know, they get a lot of buzz. I'm curious, like, what does it look like at the beginning when it comes to fundraising? Because to sell people on a self-driving car idea is like 10 years ago is very different than, you know, now because of like you guys' success. And then there's like a lot of Elon Musk factors out there that's like playing to investors' mind. Like, how did that go at the beginning? And how did you guys kind of like make sure that investors get the message of like, you know, you will be the category king to a degree? Let me start by saying, I think you you touched on the point, which is, a lot of people are out there kind of expounding how great their companies are and how awesome things are and how much money they've raised and how big the teams are. But from the early days, at least for for us, it's been about how do we deliver a product that people are going to love? And even you know, 10 years later, we have yet to do that from my perspective. And so we are not yet successful in that goal. I think we will get there. I think we're we're starting to see the early signs of something that is really like can change the world and people will love. But that has always been the goal. Fundraising, the number of people, the size of the company getting acquired, that's all been in service to this larger effort that we want to change the world and we won't be successful until that happens. And so to that end, everything we do has been about how do we hit the milestone we need to hit to show the progress that we need to show to raise the money that we need to raise so that we can then build this really amazing product. If we had known you know, 10 years ago that it would take us this long and this much money and investment to do it, I don't know that we would have gone out and said, okay, we're going to build the self-driving car company. But you know, part of the success has been, you know, we have been focused on the next milestone in front of us and trying to figure out how quickly can we hit that and have been basically at every point in time, uh, every technical challenge, been able to figure out a way to overcome it. So when we were raising, you know, there were a lot of people who passed simply because Google had its car company now Waymo at the time, and they had been working on it for you know four or five years already. People who weren't interested and said, "Okay, it's too hard," you know, obviously, like or or, or Google already has an advantage, and you're never going to catch up to them. But for us, it was look, you know, you, it's hard to argue against, right? There's a company out there that doesn't have a product that has an advantage. You can't really be like, "Oh, here's the flaws in that" or, or whatnot. We just said, look, we know what we can do. We know what we want to do. And here's proof that we are moving quickly along this path. And that helped us find Spark Capital, who led our Series A, and investors like Sam Altman and other people in kind of the YC community. And they believed in us and they saw the velocity that we were building and kind of making things. Um, and that was true when we sat down with GM in 2016. And then they eventually acquired us. So, yeah, I mean, to get back to your question, I think we always thought it was easier than it, it was. Turns mm -hmm. out it was pretty difficult, but at the same time, that creates barriers to entry and creates a moat for us to deploy something that we, we think can have this kind of life-changing technology. First of all, like, it's really bold for you guys to kind of like believe this will happen because I think a lot of entrepreneurs coming from a non-technical background like myself, I think it's kind of impossible to even have the self-confidence to join a company like this or like just to like thrive in it. Like you are 
a co-founder in the company and then you are obviously like doing really well for yourself i think like there's definitely a lot to learn from you on like how do you see the world to like give you the confidence to like as a non-technical person to like join this much of a technical company and then play a really really important role and the other thing you just mentioned about like focusing on the next milestone really resonate with me like because a lot of times when we're thinking about oh i want to be let's say like at the joe rogan of the world like in the next 10 years but it's like impossible to think of like what you can do within like this 10 year time zone but like instead of that like focusing on the next step like this is like a really interesting message and i personally really resonate with that i'm curious like you also briefly talked about like you know you guys early investor including sam outman and like a lot of like yc people there's a lot of founders that's really close to you and your brother and i'm curious like what were your observations on the top yc founders observing him from like afar it seems like you know at the beginning he did other startups but like it was not like quite as successful as like chat gpt nowadays and you see him like, you know, running YC and then you see him like quitting that to do open AI. Like, you know, nobody heard about open AI for like five years and then now it's blowing up. I'm curious throughout your cohort of friends um, through this YC journey, what do you think were like differentiating the top founders versus like average founders? It's hard for me to say, you know, what is the quality that everyone has, but I, I think... Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a couple things that came to mind as you were, you know, describing this. Uh, first off, for me, I am extremely risk seeking. I think I am an extremely risk seeking individual. You know, I want to go big or go home in everything that I do, and uh, I, I think that that has helped really place these bets on, like, okay, you know, this is a company that you know, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work, but at the end of the day, at least I'll learn a lot and mm -hmm. I will have a great story to tell on why I started mm -hmm. trying to build a self-driving car, right? That was kind of my mentality coming off of exec, uh, which we had just, mm -hmm. and the second thing, you know, I think is a lot of people who start these companies are not just looking to make money, right? Not making money is, is a byproduct of, of it, but they're really trying to change the world, right? You look at mm -hmm. the companies that of the most successful people, it's been how do we build a product that a lot of people are going to want, a lot of people are going to love, and that has this market and can be really compelling and exciting and, and be able to tell that vision to other people and get them excited about it. The thing I talk about uh, or that I'm grateful for every day is that you know there's three thousand people in this company and they all chose to come work at cruise today mm. uh they are probably the top of their class in a lot of cases they have every opportunity every job opportunity out there and they choose to come to cruise and so you know it's it's humbling that a lot of people have decided that this is where they want to spend their time and i i think you know Kyle's done a really good job of explaining why it's important, explaining how this is going to change and transform society. And that's something that we continue to do. And so I see a lot of great co-founders being able to do that, to be able to attract the best people, to be able to you know, have a vision, stick with it. Right? The thing that we are building today is you know, what we pivoted to you know, after the, the first prototypes back in 2015. And we are still working on that. We still believe that this is the future. We still have the same kind of North Star uh, that we've been working towards. So all that to say, you know, I think the best founders, you know, have this idea of where they want to go, what the future is going to look like, and kind of march blindly towards that, you know, in some mm -hmm. cases, maybe a little too much, but, uh, you know, it's worked out for us. You mentioned about having this giant vision from your brother's podcast. I've heard that like you guys sold Cruise to GM for over $1 billion within 30 days. What I thought was really interesting was like, so at the beginning, it was this scout from GM that kind of like you guys were kind of like stayed in touch after he came to the Bay Area to kind of like try to scout 
these like tech companies for GM. And later on, like you guys were really focusing on updating him on these like small milestones that you guys have accomplished. And then eventually it was acquired. I'm curious, like how did those process happen? And then like, what do you feel like was the challenges if you guys were just building it along, like, you know, like a Tesla or something compared to you guys wanted to partner with like a company like GM? Yeah. So maybe to answer the last part first, I think we were naive in the fact that we thought when we started this company that we could retrofit cars. Mm -hmm. And what we've learned through our partnership with GM and Honda and, and building cars with them and building a car from the ground up that we're about to launch is that it is very, it is a super complicated system and it is very difficult to make something safe and foolproof in this way kind of redundant on your own taking a car retrofitting it and making that work at scale is it was kind of a pipe dream but we thought we could do it and, and we kind of marched towards that i think that's what we've learned since working with gm when we sold to them it was really about how do we basically how do we get our goal of autonomous vehicles out to the public as quickly as possible. And it felt like GM could unlock not just a lot of resources, but this vehicle platform that they had in the bolt mm -hmm. that would really help us accelerate our vision. And so they took a chance on us and we took a chance on them that they understood what we were trying to build and that they wouldn't, you know, come in and shut it down. And to their credit, they've done a they've been great giving us but the resources and the room to build. And I think we're starting to see that pay off we're starting to see the we're starting to deploy the vehicles and get customers in the vehicles and start mm -hmm. to get like real feedback on on what's working what what isn't and that's exciting it's probably the most exciting time in cruise's history right now mm -hmm. and it starts you know with that scout as he mentioned from gm coming out and saying hey you know you guys are building something that is interesting. It's not there yet, but you know, I'll come back in three months, and then you know, seeing the change, I think, has uh, really helped uh, sell it internally. When you guys first started, you mentioned like Waymo was already doing Waymo for like four, five years, and then nowadays, like there's Tesla, and then like there's other self-driving car companies that's doing similar things. How do you focus on your unfair advantage? To do this and then with the help of gm like what do you feel like are things that you could leverage to make this process faster in terms of unfair advantages it's it's hard for me as an outsider who doesn't mm -hmm. ride in you know a waymo to be like oh this is mm -hmm. where we're better at the same time i think we try and let our record and speak for itself you know, we just recently crossed the 2 million miles of driverless driving. And, you know, that's a huge milestone, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and we hit a million miles earlier this year. And, you know, in a few months we hit, you know, two. And so you can see the rate at which we're accelerating and uh, deploying these vehicles and getting riders and, and all of that. And, you know, for us, it's about getting to scale because that is what is going to provide a real service to people, right? A hundred cars in a city is interesting. It's great, right? It's it's really cool to see. It's awesome for a few people. But, you know, if you have a hundred riders all taking a ride at the same time, then you've got no cars available for that next 101st rider, right? Mm -hmm. And so you could start to see where the system breaks if you don't have enough cars because you don't have enough scale to service all the customers and move people around that need to so it can't be relied on and that's that's one of the core things that we try and focus on is what is how do we build a reliable product for our users so you know I, without commenting on the other company strategies because uh, you know I, I don't think i have the all the information to to do that mm -hmm. you know we know our strategy is uh, build the cars, make them safe, and get them out to users and scale it as quickly as we can so that we can make real money and uh, provide a great service for people. And I think we're well on the way of doing that. To understand more about like 
your thinking for framework from like, you know, starting a company <laughs> to running a company. Let's say if you and I are starting a company today, what are like three things we should do to figure out our idea, get funding and keep running the company? Like how do we set the milestone after that? Well, I think assuming we've got an idea, first thing is to figure it has out- It to be risky. Yeah, it's got to be something that you and I want to dedicate the next 10 years of our life to. And we've got to be willing to stand by it through the ups and the downs. And so really making sure that this is something that we are excited about is probably first. The second thing is we got to understand, uh, from my perspective, what is the next milestone that is going to get people excited, right? To mm -hmm. check the boxes, as one of our board members says to you know show proof that okay all you need is this next bit of money or this mm -hmm. you know whatever it is um how do you what do you what do you need to prove to people and that that kind of becomes the next milestone that we should be working towards and then what are the resources that we need to achieve that and so i think you know breaking it down in a, a few of those steps is where i'd start Thank you. Like, why do you feel like risk was something that you're like not afraid of? Like you're seeking risk? It's a good question. I don't know that I was always this way. In fact, you know, before I graduated from college, I really thought I was going to go be like a, an investment banker or an accountant somewhere. And that was kind of the, the thing that everyone pitched was, oh, go work at like a KPMG and, you know, a, or a BCG. And the school I went to, Claremont McKenna, was kind of like a school where they recruited people like that. And so I did the whole thing. I was economics. I did a leadership sequence. I did, a, you know, a, I don't know, something else. I can't remember. But in 2009, when I graduated, the economy basically shut down and every one of those companies was basically not hiring anybody. And so I had to go look for a different path. And I think part of that, uh, was eye-opening of like, okay, you don't have to go and sit in this office and work a nine to five. And if you're there for a year, you get promoted. And if you're there for two years, you go to business school. And if you go to business school and come back, then you get promoted again. And it's kind of like this track that everyone's on. And so over time, I think I just learned like, look, dude, there's all these things that are assumptions that people make in their life mm -hmm. that if you go out and you start to question, okay, what's the reasoning behind them? They might fall apart. And, you know, I don't know that people are happier because they're accountants. I don't know that they feel like they're more fulfilled. I'm not knocking that up as a profession. I'm sure there are people who are, but uh, for me, I think a lot of these kind of assumptions of how things should work or what I was told became just that there were people's opinions of uh based on you know their own assumptions and so i think over time i've just gradually shifted my window and being willing to try something and do new things it didn't come naturally for me but it's something that now i'm like yeah that makes sense i like i at the time when we started these companies i was younger no medical bills really mm -hmm. like i think i subsisted off of like maybe a thousand dollars a month like ramen and mm -hmm. I had my mattress on the floor in my room type of thing so i could take those risks and i think that that was that was awesome it was it was great i, I know not everyone can but it is uh, i think that's that's something that i did early and i think it luckily it's paid off do you feel like your business partners are kind of like more towards a similar side with you? Are they like the opposite? Like, are they more of the following the rules type of people? Uh, well, Kyle is definitely not a following the rules type of person. At the same time, he is very thorough in his thinking. He wants to think things through. He's very methodical about, okay, what does this mean? How does this play out? What is what happens? And I think that that, that is a really, like, really great skill to to be able to think that far ahead it kind of reminds me of chess right he's like <laughs> 10 moves ahead or more i am much more of the hey that's a great idea let's like go try it and figure out type of person and i think that leads me it's, it's a good balance i think in, in some cases right it's like 
this is what we think we have conversations about the strategy of like okay this is where we think we could go and i'm i feel like i'm we're both quick to action but uh i'll be the person who's like great sounds great let's do it and, and just start uh going from there so i don't think it's necessarily something that everyone on your team has to have Mm -hmm. uh, you want to get balance. You want people who have different skill sets from you so that we balance each other out. Um, and that that's what's worked well for us. When at the beginning, since like you were non-technical, how did you quickly acquire the knowledge of self-driving car? And do you feel like as a founder or like as a um, founder who is more towards like operation and then like design the product like do you feel like you need really deep knowledge in self-driving car in terms of the technology itself or do you feel like you want to spend more of your time on the business use case or like kind of like positioning it as something that people would use that's a great question maybe to start we have this running joke or we we had this joke at, at cruise where i would do certain tasks or things at Cruise at the direction of like the people who are much more technical. But I, I knew enough and I'm handy enough to like do certain things, right? Mm -hmm. I could, at one point early on, I was drilling holes in the top of the Audi to like fit the system onto the car. And I was like up there with the drill and thinking, huh, this is interesting. Like <laughs> literally putting a hole in the top of, of this car. I hope it's in the right place. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, you know, that, that's, uh, I, I built the first website that we had uh, as an example, and I was super proud of it. And then another person came in and like rewrote it like a year later in like, I don't know, probably like a day. And so I, I was never like, I, I know enough to understand from a first principles perspective, what is going on, but I'll never be the person who is the, you know, perception expert who tells you exactly how the system works today, especially today now that it's like super mm -hmm. complicated. But throughout this process, I've learned a lot and enough to to be able to you know point people in the right direction and and keep them moving and 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 also to understand how it all fits together to build the right product. Mm. And, and as an example, my team works on the front end and what you display to users. It has an effect on you know how they they enjoy the product or, or not right and, and we make some very deliberate choices around what we show to people based on the car's interactions and what's going on in the world at any given time so that uh, we can optimize that experience for you and so you know being non-technical has not stopped me as long as i've been willing to learn and and willing to understand and we had some really good early engineers who were willing to explain it as well. Um, and I you know, always remember them for, for helping me through that as well. Going through this entire phase, like from like a founder's perspective, what do you think makes a good investor? Let's say like if I want to invest in a company like Cruise, but as a non-technical person, I will have absolutely no clue what the hell is going on on the technical side. How should I identify a company like this? Yeah, well, to start, I think great investors are people who are not looking at what is currently happening, but where things are going, right, and, and the trends. It's really hard, though, if you're non-technical to identify the good companies and the bad ones, especially in this day and age when it's really easy to start to put things together. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think finding someone who does understand the technical details is what's going to separate, you know, a real company from one that is pretending to be a real company and, or, or might have ambitions, right? Maybe that maybe they're not even, it's not like they're not wrong, right? They 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 all mean it, they're mean well, but it eventually might not work because of a technical limitation. And that's really hard to know if you're not technical. And so uh, a lot of I've seen a lot of non-technical people find technical advisors for their funds or you know, technical partners to, to help do the diligence in that way. And so I, I think that that's a one way of doing it. Okay. So we're at the one minute fire round for you. So like, what's your favorite book? Oh, my favorite book. 
Man, there's so many. I think I feel like the book I've been reading most recently is actually To My Son. And uh, that's One Fish, Two Fish. Nice. Who made the biggest impact in your career? I mean, the biggest impact in my career, I, it's probably my brother, right? Starting a company with him, the advice he's given me, it's been, he's been a great rock. Who do you invite to your dinner party? Uh, mostly just my friends, uh, close friends, uh, the kind of the group that we talked about earlier. Uh, where can we find you outside of work? Uh, well, now I've got a one-year-old son, so it's probably playing with him. He's, he's still... Uh, in the wanting to hang out with me at all times phase. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Daniel, for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Grace. It's been great chatting. Thanks for tuning into Smart Venture Podcast. If you learned something from the episode or even just mildly tolerated me, please subscribe and leave a five-star rating. I promise I will keep bringing you more successful, insightful interviews and insider tips about startups. Remember, sharing is caring. So tell your friends to listen to or enemies, I won't judge. Until next time, keep venturing smartly.